Welcome to Tentpole Trauma, the podcast where we look at movies that came with hype and high hopes, but left with crushing disappointment, either critically, at the box office, or both. Freed from the weight of expectations, we seek to examine these underperformers under a new light, parsing through the good, the bad, and everything in between with the hopes of gaining a better understanding as to why they failed to find their audience. Warning, there will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie that we're discussing today, I suggest you stop the podcast and go watch it. Then when you come back and listen, you'll get more out of the discussion. This episode, we discuss Exorcist 2, The Heretic. I'm Sebastian, and I'm here with Jennifer. Hello. And welcoming back to the podcast, regular contributor, Rodney. Hey, guys. Thanks for once again having me back. Yay. We love to talk lots of things with you, Rodney, but we really like to talk horror, and this is one of our special horror episodes. For those of you just tuning into the podcast for the first time in your miserable life, Rodney is the co-host of the Pod Forsaken Horror Podcast, which their podcast, they recommend a sort of obscure horror movie every episode. Usually I ask Rodney to give us a recommendation, but I'm not going to do that this time, Rodney. I don't really care what your recommendation is. (laughs) That's all right. I didn't want to tell you. You don't watch them anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Because Jennifer and I are very excited to be guests on the upcoming Pod Forsaken show. Woo! We are so excited to have you. We can't wait. We're really pumped, and I'm not being at all facetious when I say that. They're allowing us to bring to them two horror movies that we really like, some horror movies that are sort of lesser known. One of them is somewhat well-known, and then one, I think, is really virtually unknown. But we're very excited to talk about it with you, Rodney. Yeah, I uh, we always ask our guests, like, hey, pick, a, pick an obscure horror movie that you like and you wish more people knew about. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if we're spoiling what you picked, but one of them I'd heard of but never seen. The other one, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Like, I've yeah. never heard this title in my life. I'm pretty sure I know which one. Uh, it turns out my co-host has like a signed copy of the DVD of that one, so he knew it. <laughs> That's actually really cool, and I look forward to getting the story behind that. Yeah, I, I have personally not asked him because I want to do it live, on, you know, or on the air or whatever. What have you? That's awesome. I'm. We're both really excited, and uh, yes. stay tuned for our uh, guest appearances on the Pod Forsaken podcast. But we're not here to talk about that tonight. Yeah, fuck that show. 
We're here to talk about a not so obscure horror movie or Actually, it kind of is kind of obscure considering what a massive franchise it belongs to. But Exorcist 2, The Heretic, the 1977 John Borman sequel to the original mega hit, The Exorcist. Now, as horror fans, I'm assuming that we all have history with The Exorcist and The Exorcist franchise. Jen, what is your history with The Exorcist and the franchise? I've seen all of the movies in The Exorcist franchise. Um, I've, of course, initially seen The Exorcist, not in the theater. I did see it in the theater when they brought it back. I think it was in 2000. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, but that was that was the first time. Other would have been, uh, I'm sure it was a VHS rental. I have a, a funny history with Exorcist 2. I was, I think I was around 12 or so. My parents were going out for the evening and I was staying home by myself. And I, th I think I had rented Exorcist 2 or it might have been on TV. I can't recall. But this was the first time I'd seen it. And I also was watching this film and I started to not feel so well. So I, I actually had um, like had a fever and was getting sick. So I didn't see the movie again for a number of years. And what I recalled of it was that, you know, it kind of felt like a, a fever dream because I had not been feeling well. Mm -hmm. And then when I did revisit it later, I was like, no, it's, it's, it wasn't that at all. It wasn't the fever. It was just it the wasn't movie. The fever. It was just the movie. I guess, I mean, side note, I had a similar thing happen watching, I told you this, watching 90210 when the cramps were at the peach pit once. And I also, again, was sick. And I was like, I must have dreamt that. And this was in the 90s where I couldn't research it or anything for, for so for years. I thought I just had this like crazy fever dream. And no, it really was real. I was able to find that later. So anyway, it's not the first time that's happened. Yeah. And then Exorcist 3, I've also um, I, I saw, I think it was VHS rental as well. Excellent cyst. <laughs> Rodney, what is your history with The Exorcist and The Exorcist franchise? Strangely, my history is a little spotty on this one. I saw The Exorcist when I was really young. My dad showed it to me. And it traumatized me. Like, it was fucking terrifying, you know? And by little, I mean, I was probably, like, 10 years old. You know, like, he should not... Like, I grew up in a household where we just watched a lot of horror movies. And so I think he thought I could handle it. Turns out that one... That gave me nightmares. And to this day, I think it might be the best horror movie ever made. Like, we could get into a debate. I would also accept The Shining as your answer. But then, like, I never saw part two. I just heard it was stupid. So I never watched it. And then I've also... And I'm ashamed. I've never seen part three. But people say part three is dope, right? It's pretty good. But I did see the the two prequels they made, like the the whatever. There's like the version that came out by Rennie Hart. Exorcist, the beginning, and Ec Dominion was the other one. Dominion, a prequel to the Exorcist, whatever. So I've seen yeah. those. So I feel like I'm pretty well versed on Father Marin, you know, but this was my first viewing of Exorcist 2. My history is similar to Jen's. I did not see The Exorcist until I was probably 13 or 14, and I saw it on TV. And I remember it was a pretty big deal because, you know, I, it had this reputation of being the scariest movie of all time. I wouldn't necessarily argue with you if you wanted to say that The Exorcist is the greatest horror movie of all time. I think it's worthy of that title. Personally, I'm more of a Shining fan. I also consider Alien a horror movie, so that would also probably take my top spot. But like, if you were like, no, The Exorcist is the best, I'm like, okay, sure, fine. That It's worthy of that. But when I saw it when I was 14, you know, you're sort of cynical at that age and everybody's telling you this is the greatest horror movie ever. So I was like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. In the ensuing years, I've really come to appreciate it as a movie, just all the things that it does amazingly well and the things about it that are sort of objectively scary. I'm also not really a devil guy. Devils don't scare me for whatever reason. So I don't know. Devil movies have never particularly scared me. The Omen creeps me out a little bit for some weird reason, but The Exorcist never quite got to me. But like Jen, I also saw The Exorcist 2 on TV. In fact, I think they played them back to back one night or something when I was a kid. And so I watched them back to back. And I remember thinking like The Exorcist 2 was just bonkers. All I remembered about it was those shots of the locust, like mm -hmm. when you're like behind the locust or in front of the locust. And I was like, yeah, there's something to do with a locust and the 
Africa or something. And I just thought it was nuts and nothing like an exorcist movie that I wanted to see, which I think most of the world feels about this movie. So yeah, I'd only seen it then. And then later I kind of came back to it because I heard this song called Magic and Ecstasy by Anino Morricone, who did the score for the film. And the theme to Magic and Ecstasy is actually in the movie a lot. It's sort of a recurring theme, but there's a really kick-ass rock version of it that you only hear if you watch the trailer for Exorcist 2, which I think is one of the greatest crazy horror movie trailers of all time. And I'm going to just say it up in front. If you have any interest in this movie, just watch the trailer for Exorcist 2 because the trailer for Exorcist 2 is an awesome movie. The Exorcist 2 itself, not so much, but that trailer rules and that song rules. And my band, The Ghost of Tony Gold, learned it and played it live, that song. And it was a barn burner. People loved it, even though nobody knew what the hell it was. It's just this kick-ass rock tune. So... That kind of brought me back to The Exorcist 2 a little bit because I was like, you know, I was like looking at the CD that it was on. And I was like, this was from Exorcist 2? Crazy. And then when I started working at Cinephile, I revisited the movie and I'll save my thoughts on it. But I came to appreciate it in a way. Yeah, that's sort of my history with Exorcist 2. I've seen all the Exorcist movies. We have the Exorcist box set on Blu-ray. You know, I've seen them all. I, I enjoy most of them to some degree or another. I like the Paul Schrader version of the prequel just because it's crazy. And I do like Exorcist 3. I don't think I've seen the prequels. The Rennie Harlan one is a really standard Exorcist horror movie, like really kind of bog standard. And then the Paul Schrader one is kind of equally bad in its own way, but it's more interesting. It's guilty of being kind of boring, but it's <laughs> kind of, it's more interesting than the dumb down Rennie Harland version. They're kind of fascinating to watch back to back because it's almost the same movie, but like key elements have been changed and swapped out. It's it's weird. It's a weird experience. It's really weird because yeah, they both they both star. Is it Stellan Skarsgård? Yep. He plays a young fa Father Marin, yeah. A lot of the sets are the same. Like, in many ways, are the same movie. In other ways, are totally different. Yeah. And I remember when the Rennie Harlan one came out, which was first, I remember just, like, ranting about, like, fucking Hollywood meddling with art and, you know, like, how dare you suppress Paul Schrader's ge genius? Right. And then a year later, I got to see that, and I was like, oh, I get why they totally redid really this. This is terrible. Yeah. This is really boring. <laughs> It's maybe the only time that I've agreed with what Holly like with with Hollywood stepping in and being like, we're just redoing it. Well, I mean, you can agree with them that the Paul Schrader version wasn't going to be anything people enjoyed. But why do you get Rennie Har? I mean, get somebody better than Rennie Harlan. Because Rennie Harlan's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen a Rennie Harlan movie I didn't like. Wow, you like Cutthroat Island? That is the worst of them, but I it was enjoyable. But I love Cliffhanger. I love Driven. He did Deep Blue Sea. Deep Blue I know sea. he did Deep Blue Sea. Deep I sea. even like Devil's Pass. Well, I haven't seen that, so I can't comment on it. I know. No one that's why I leaned in when I said it, because no one's seen Devil's Pass. He's got some new movie out. You should see that. It's got like uh doesn't it have like Pierce Brosnan in it or something? I didn't know that. I'm in. I'll watch it. Yeah, go look on iTunes. There it is. I wanted to just say I do uh, agree with Rodney about the original Exorcist that I think it could be the best horror movie of all time. And I agree with yeah. what you were saying, Sebastian, as far as seeing it at a certain age mm -hmm. um, and growing to appreciate it more. Because I think like the people that I know and, and Sebastian and I have talked about this, like the people that I know that are like really traumatized by it were like grew up very Catholic. So it's just like yeah. it's the scariest thing that could happen. Yeah. I also think that when the the age that that you said you saw it, Sebastian, and, and I can't remember exactly when I saw the the first one, but I I did see it before scene two, which was around twelve or so. I think I I grew to appreciate it more later because it's just a really great drama, 
And it has like amazing effects and it has like some, it's really disturbing. But what's also really great about it is it doesn't ha- it doesn't really build tension. Like shit just happens. Yeah. Like we just re- we just rewatched it the other day just because I was like, oh, let's rewatch The Exorcist. I, I know the movie well and I know like that the things are going to happen, but I don't really remember when they're going to happen because they just happen. Like it's not like, oh, we're building to something. You can't feel it coming. It's like, oh, we just go into the room and this is happening now, you know, or like, or we go into the room and it's kind of like some, you know, things are a little weird. And then we go to like the scene where she's like got the crucifix, you know, and it it just kind of comes at you like that. So I think that's one of the things that really works about the film and, and really traumatizes people as well, because it just hits you with this trauma out of nowhere. It's not like a, a, a built, tension building type horror. The reason it's sort of like that is because William Friedkin came out of documentary filmmaking. We watched French Connection and it definitely has a sort of documentary feel, which yeah. is, was carried yeah. over to The Exorcist, which um, this movie has none of. This movie completely abandons that for ridiculousness. Do we have anything else to say about The Exorcist before we move on? Before we move on to the superior exorcist film? Yeah, forget about that exorcist. Who cares about that? (laughs) Who'd want to hear people discuss that when you can hear people discuss Exorcist 2, The Heretic? Now, this was, as I said, directed by John Borman, and I'm actually a John Borman fan. Yes, you are. It's a bit of a controversial stance because John Borman has... Movies like this movie that get completely lambasted by most people, such as Zardoz. I don't know if uh, you've ever seen Zardoz, Rodney. Have Have you ever seen Zardoz? I've seen parts of it. I've never actually given it a full viewing. Well, I love Zardoz and I love his Arthurian tale Excalibur. It was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. This movie sort of fits in between those two movies, so I sort of see Exorcist II, The Heretic, as part of a gonzo trilogy. Interestingly, John Borman was almost uh, the director of the first Exorcist, but he passed on it. Now, this movie was originally conceived just to be a really cynical, cheap Exorcist sequel knockoff where they were just going to basically do the same thing again. But then once John Borman came on, he had all these heady ideas and he got the screenwriter to get on board with his crazy ideas. So that's how we ended up with this weird fever dream drug movie. Well, I I appreciate that the the background there because I was going to say is John Borman to blame here or the screenwriter because my issues with this movie are not so much in the directing as in the the writing but now that I understand that he basically was like no 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 let's let's fucking change everything then yeah I'm gonna put this on Borman John Borman was sort of like a crazy hippie drug guy so you know this English wacky dude who would make these you know real mind bending movies all to not terribly commercial effect, but <laughs> back then in the 70s, you could actually make crazy movies about like crazy ideas and people would see it. Wasn't Zardoz like a gigantic financial failure? Yes. So and they and they let him and they let that guy this because this was the movie he made right after Zardoz. Why would you give the Exorcist franchise to that man? The patriarchy, I guess. <laughs> I guess. And I guess there was no Exorcist franchise at the time. But I'll tell you this, if I had like a gigantic, like my biggest movie in the last 10 years, I certainly wouldn't let the failed filmmaker of Zardoz direct the sequel. <laughs> well, I think also at the time, sequels were really looked down upon. Like Ellen Burstyn flat out refused to have anything to do with this without even being like shown a script. She was like, no fucking way. You know, th- this was before like Jaws 2 hadn't even come out yet. The Empire Strikes Back hadn't come out with. I mean, there were sequels made, but it wasn't like a you know, thing that was just automatically done. And I think that nobody wanted to do this. There weren't people lining up wanting to do The Exorcist 2. You know, I think he, he was given it as sort of like a, oh, okay, here, you can make this piece of shit. It wasn't some prestigious gig like it might be now. All right, I'll buy your made up answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we start off the movie with this kind of a prologue where we're in South America and we're introduced to our new main priest, Father Lamont, 
played by Richard Burton. And he's performing an exorcism of sorts on this woman who is some sort of healer in this small little village. And she's going crazy and stuff. And she ends up like lighting herself on fire. And he's standing aghast in horror. She lights herself on fire. This is important because this theme, the idea here is that the demon that's going to be plaguing our father, Lamont here, seeks out healers. And so that's why he's targeted this woman. But right away, this scene is just kind of bug nuts. Just the way it's shot and the way it looks and the way it's performed. Richard Burton, I think, was on something of a downswing in his career at this point. So he seems like he's in sort of ham mode and he doesn't really ever get out of it. I suspect he was probably half in the bag the whole time. I think I read that like he was drunk for most of the movie and Linda Blair was high for most of it. And I can 100% believe that, judging from their performances. They seem like the performances of people who are inebriated. Let me ask you a quick question. I obviously know who Richard Burton is, but for those listening who don't know, what's he more famous for? Uh, well, he's most famous for having a relationship with Liz Taylor at, during the height of her fame. You know, honestly, I haven't seen a lot of his movies. He was a big leading man in the 50s and 60s. I think that all sort of came to an end with the movie Cleopatra, which starred Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, and it was one of the biggest bombs of all time. Ah, right. And like I said, I haven't seen that many of his movies. He's a little crusty for my generation. But, you know, to get him in an Exorcist sequel in 1977 was probably something of a get. It was probably like, OK, at least we have <laughs> Richard Burton. We're making a sequel to The Exorcist. Get me that Zardoz guy and that Cleopatra guy. <laughs> yeah, how did this fail? Like, I mean, we're gonna have we're gonna have a really difficult discussion at the end of this, trying to figure out what went wrong. Can I tell you, I like this opening scene, man. I just I I did not expect this movie to be like such a globe trotting adventure. I think that's that's one of the things that it kind of impressed me. But I want to be clear, this is a really weird and bad movie. But yes. The fact that it started in this like weird, very like psychedelic isn't the right word, but it was a trippy opening, right? And the yes. fact that it opens with this woman like burning alive, I was like, okay, I'm in. It's definitely an opening. I will say that like Richard Burton is so boring in this movie. This is one of the most boring film characters I have ever seen. At one point, he's like literally comatose walking around. <laughs> like they actually work it into the plot. He can be a zombie just walking around. You hear Lin Linda Blair saying repeatedly, come back to me, father. Let me reach you, father, because he's just yeah. like completely just staring off into like just he's gone. Yeah, they set him down in a chair and just have him stare for long scenes at a time. So I think it's pretty uh, much a given that he's delivering virtually nothing this whole time. Although sometimes he's so like at 10 and hammy that it's sort of jarring. But yeah, it's a objectively bad performance most of the time he seems zombified and out of it but every now and then you get these bursts of mania which i find sort of delightful i have something to share regarding the first 10 minutes of this film uh, that was in, in the imdb trivia and this is a story from uh william friedkin who i guess had heard this what had happened and, and had shared it at the at a, the Chicago Critics Film Festival uh, back in 2013. He said that studio heads came to the sneak preview of Exorcist 2 in a limo, and they told the drivers to go get fast food. They entered the auditorium, and within 10 minutes into the film, an audience member stood up, glanced into the crowd, and proclaimed, the people who made this piece of shit are in this room. 10 or 12 other audience members gathered to find the executives. The heads rushed out of the theater and realized there were no cars to make their escape. They were subsequently chased down the street by a group of angry audience members. Stories like that have plagued this movie ever since it came out. I mean, there were stories of whole theaters full of people erupting in laughter, derisive laughter. Friedkin himself was convinced to step into a screening room while he was working on probably Sorcerer or whatever and watch the first 10 minutes. And he was like, this is the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen. And he, he said it made his own his movie even worse just by existing. So, yeah, he was not a fan at all, which... I wouldn't imagine he would be. 
So we get the sort of central setup of the film in a scene where Father Lamont goes to the Cardinal at the Vatican or something, and the Cardinal tells him he needs to investigate the death of Father Marin, and Father Marin is the priest (laughs) who is the hero or one of the heroes of the original Exorcist. And they're basically saying that he's going to be a heretic, and hence the title of the film. So Father Lamont has basically got to go and clear up Father Marin's reputation for reasons or whatever. First of all, I kind of, I wish this movie had like little like slug lines for locations, and I wish it said the Vatican or something. (laughs) But second of all, I totally missed the line that you're talking about. And so I literally came here tonight to record to ask you, why is this called The Heretic? Like, I genuinely had no clue. Honestly, Rodney, it's taken me like four viewings of the movie (laughs) to even discern that fact. There's so many little details and bits and pieces of this movie that I have not did not catch in the first, second, third, fourth viewing. So it's only because I've seen this movie a bunch of times. And this time I really was trying to pay attention. In fact, I watched it twice just for this review, just so I could pick up on these little details because I knew there would be so many questions because it is virtually impossible to pay attention to it all you cannot follow it i feel a little better i feel a little better now okay rodney i've seen this movie multiple times and i just learned that right here with you if there's gonna be a lot of learning tonight like an hour and a half in and this is this is like a two-hour movie this is a lengthy chunk of time i was like when's the heretic gonna show up is someone even gonna <laughs> is someone gonna say the word like <laughs> One more thing I just learned also that I I, I feel is important um, talking about Richard Burton is that he openly admitted in interviews that this was a paycheck picture for him. Mm. Quote, I had a divorce coming up and then parentheses to Elizabeth Taylor. I needed money for that. Oh, that's good that this helped pay the, the divorce for Elizabeth Taylor. I'm glad some good came of this. That's why he was there. So the next section of our movie takes place largely in New York City. And largely in this crazy psychiatric institute that is run by Louise Fletcher from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Dr. Jean Tuscan. I guess she was just typecast around this time as a person who dealt with crazy people or whatever. A stern medical professional. (laughs) Right. That was her thing. So she's there. And this is a institute that deals with people with learning disabilities, um, you know, mental issues of all types. But the thing that's so insane about this, so this is dealing with people who have like cognitive issues or whatever, but the way this place is laid out would drive you insane. Like it's all like glass honeycombs and she can like control the lights going up and down like all over the place. It is bonkers. And if I was having mental issues, I would not feel better being in this place at all. Yeah, dude. I, I For those who have not seen this movie, words cannot describe how fucking bonkers this hospital looks. In fact, my, my <laughs> wife watched it with me and she said... As the movie went along, she said, I don't think this director has ever been anywhere. Like he's never <laughs> he's never been on an airplane. He's never been to Washington. He's never been in a hospital. <laughs> because I don't know how any I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not I'm just on my couch and this place is like freaking me out. What about like little autistic children? Like, <laughs> this is the most nightmarish <laughs> hospital ever constructed. It it honestly looks like Pinhead made this. Like you go you go to this hospital. <laughs> If you play with the box. Yeah, it is nuts. But I have to say, I kind of love it. Yeah. Because there, you've never seen anything like this in your life. No. Never. And it's so 70s. Like, it is it is such, like, not the greatest, but 70s architecture. Like, weird. Like, it's just, it's bonkers. Yeah, they have those sort of, like, plastic chairs that they used to have. And just the craziest 70s shit. This movie is super 70s. Yes. Like everybody's outfits are just the height of hideous 70s fashion. Poor Linda Blair gets the worst of it. I mean, she is braless in every outfit, <laughs> like jiggling around <laughs> in just the most ridiculous, crazy crap. But if you love that crazy 70s fashion and shit, it's kind of a great 
smorgasbord of production design. She does have some really pretty dresses at one point, but they totally don't fit. It's like, it's bizarre with everything else that's going on. Like there are some points where she has like these white, like kind of, what is that designer? I can't remember. It was like so big in the seventies where anyway, it just seems like she should be out in a field with like flowers and you know, it's, it's uh, Laura Ashley, like kind of like that, but it doesn't fit with like, the lame pant suit pajama thing that happens later and I, yeah. I i don't know it's 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 all over the place it's all over the map let's talk a little bit though about ray uh reagan mcneil as played by linda blair obviously she was the star of the first movie she was the possessed girl and i think largely it is considered that her performance is one of the best child performances in all of horror at this point she's 17 years old i think she was one of only a few of the original cast members that were convinced to come back. Right around this time, maybe a few months later of filming this, she was arrested for cocaine possession. So she was already headed towards drug problems. And as Rodney already said, she is admitted to being on drugs for most of this movie. So, you know, she seems like a 70s, swinging 70s teen here. But, you know, she's sort of playing this sweet she's still sort of supposed to be sweet but she's also kind of saying she doesn't remember what happened to her in the first movie but we find out she really does and she's being treated for these you know memories or whatever it's a lot to ask of her and she definitely I don't think fully pulls it off. She seems, as we said, a little bit out of it. I do feel like she's at least kind of giving it her her all. <laughs> but in comparison to her performance as a 14-year-old in The First Exorcist, it's pretty bad. Yikes. Harsh. Harsh, Sebastian. Picking on kids. <laughs> Look, how to put this. She is terrible. She is terrible in this movie. But I also acknowledge she's a 17 year old kid and like i what i can't understand is she's so good in the first one yeah how did she become so bad and maybe it's just that like they gave her more lines in this one because she's obviously in a lot of it maybe it's bad directing it's bad writing i don't know what it is there are moments where she was good yeah i don't want to across the board say it's bad but like every time there she'd be in a scene with the doctor and they would be talking i'd be like the doctor is like having like a real conversation and she's saying lines that's kind of what i'm saying is she it feels like a very prepared performance it doesn't feel natural the way she does in the original movie in the original movie she feels really natural like a teenager here she just feels like somebody kind of trying to perform exactly i think it's because she's i mean obviously as you had mentioned she gets arrested for cocaine possession not long after this i think she's definitely like checked out and i mean it was i was also reading through the trivia like she was habitually late like all the time for this like one there's even like a you know she even one day at john borman had talked about this that like she came up to him and she was like, did you, did you hear? I was only 10 minutes late today. Like that felt like she had gotten there on time. So I think she was just going through something because I think she's a, a, a great actor. And like other things she did after The Exorcist, she did a lot of TV movies that were actually really, really good. And she's really bringing it in those performances. So I think it's a combination of um, the material and that she, you know, was going through some major sh shit, it sounds like. Yeah, and I think for any, like, look, I mean, go watch that Sandra Bullock movie where that, you know, that no one saw and won a Razzie for. Like, even top tier actors have bad performances, right? Like, it just happens. Yeah. And so I'm not going to come out and say Linda Blair is a bad actress. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. No, but Jen is saying that. I think it's kind of rude. <laughs> <laughs> that's like ronnie that's exactly what i was saying i'm so glad i'm not even saying i don't like her performance i kind of love her performance in this like honestly not to show my hand too much but this movie is so crazy like if she was delivering this incredible oscar worthy performance in this nutty stew of a movie like what would he, that even look like i don't even know if i want that 
that. I kind of want these weird performances because the whole thing is just off the rails. It is off the rails and no one can stop it. There's nothing you can do. Like we're already, we're two scenes in and we're already in the craziest hospital you've ever seen dealing with a friggin' device that synchronizes people's minds so that they can look into each other's dreams or some shit. Like it's already throwing down at you impossible to believe shit and you're like okay i'm done like if you're if you're here for like a well-made thoughtfully constructed like film you're fucked like it's over like forget it you're 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 on the ride get on the ride and accept what you're being given but at the time i mean wasn't the exorcist nominated for best picture you know like i'm pretty sure it was this is exorcist 2 oh did i watch the wrong one <laughs> But what I mean is, like, you went and saw this amazing film. It's like if they made Moonlight 2, right? You'd go see Moonlight 2 expecting it to live up <laughs> some kind of quality level, and you get this movie. I get why people were upset, right? Oh, totally, yeah. I get why people were upset. Yes, I do. I'm just saying that I'm not even being critical of her performance being bad, because I think we're in a whirlwind of bad, and so I don't even really mind that she's not good in this movie. It doesn't bother That's me. That's fair. There's nowhere to go once the synchronizer comes out. I really did not expect that to be such a large part of the movie. <laughs> This movie is centered around this thing that looks like a dynamite plunger, <laughs> but has two lights on it that that go whoom, whoom, whoom. And then it's like a strobe light, a double strobe light that you stare into with somebody that brings you into a hypnotic state in which you can like access dreams and memories. And the other person doing it can see them while you're doing it. They can see your memories. Can we just take a moment also for the, the, the faces that we get as they're going into the trance? Like the faces oh, from yeah. the actors where it's just like, it's it's so like, they're like, uh, eyes are kind of rolling back or like rolling, just like these, it, it's like a, a cartoonish, like, I, I can't even, I don't know. It's just, it just makes me giggle. Like when it starts happening. Drugged out stupor, I think is the word you're looking for. It's, it's real trippy shit. It, I did like those sequences though. There was something about like the use oh, of yeah. the light and the sound effect. Like, oh yeah. It's not that it's scary, but it's, it's creepy. It, it creates like a creepy vibe. It's it's unsettling. There yeah. are things in this movie that are unsettling, yeah. mostly because there is so little logic and reason in which to apply to them. The first major scene we get with this this synchronizer, the uh, Louise Fletcher character is trying to get Reagan to take this synchronizer to you know find out what happened when she was possessed, and she doesn't want to do it. But then Father uh, Lamont shows up, and then suddenly Reagan's like. Oh, cause, because he wants to find out what happened to, to Father Marin. She's like, well, OK, I'll do it. So she goes in to do this, the synchronizer with Louise Fletcher. And what happens is so Father Marin's standing there observing this. And this is taking place in a room that's got all glass <laughs> like glass walls. There's so much reflective material, like surfaces in this movie too, which is another crazy choice. But so they're in this all glass room that's like a honeycomb shape. And we're going into this vision from the past. Linda Blair refused to be in any sort of makeup, like monster movie makeup, because she hated it so much from the original movie. So they got a different actress to play possessed Blair. Ah. <laughs> I mean, possessed Reagan, right? So we have this other person in the full exorcist makeup and poor Max von Sydow has shown up again because he's probably got a divorce he's got to pay for too, <laughs> right? So he's here. We're seeing this vision from the past where possessed Reagan is making Father Marin have a heart attack, but it's all taking place superimposed over Louise Fletcher. And Linda Blair is like behind Louise Fletcher, and it looks like she's like fondling her boobs. Yeah. Like the way it's shot looks kind of obscene but we're also getting the superimposed vision from the past that's like a horror movie scene and it's really just it's a howler of a scene so first of all i i couldn't tell if it was a different actress but i was like something's wrong with the possessed girl in this movie right her voice sounded different she was not as scary 
it makes it be weird, I guess, to have 17 year old Linda Blair play her because she would look older. Right. But like at the same time, the voice didn't sound right. Am I wrong? Did they get the same? I don't. Mercedes McCambridge is the voice in the original. I don't know if they yeah, got Yeah, I don't back. think she did it. She might have died or something. They got a different voice actor for sure. I, I thought that. Yeah, I thought that woman lived much longer. Maybe she did. Maybe she was like, fuck that movie. I'm not going to be in it like everyone else. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, I think you're right, Rodney. I don't think she passed until I'm actually looking her up right now as to what. But anyway, I, yeah, I think she lived longer. I, I think she probably just didn't want to come back like most everybody else. <laughs> Look, I like the idea of it. And I was glad because at this point, by this point in the movie, I was like, is some scary shit going to happen? And the answer is no. But at least we did get a possessed girl in this scene. Right. And like, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of like the weird boob fondling moment, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> um, I was not like I was not prepared for like, I think it's a cool effect how like her face is like like the way the light is pulsing. The, the possessed Reagan's face is like pulsing in and out of the screen like on like superimposed. Yeah. There are these moments in this film that are very like art house that I think are effective. Yeah. It's just as a whole movie that you kind of have to judge it by. Right. This, this sequence was cool. This is one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's definitely visually pretty interesting. And I think they're trying to do sort of like optical illusion type things where you're seeing a reflection and they bring up the light. So it sort of becomes more prevalent over the other image Borman is definitely a tripped out guy, so I'm sure this was all his his idea. But yeah, I mean, it's unforgettable. It's crazy. Can you remind me, why is the priest here? I didn't understand. Like, he's just like, I'm going to go find, I'm going to. He wants to find out what happened to Father Marin, how he died in the exorcism in the first film. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. I'm just making sure. This is somehow going to clear Father Marin's name if he can figure out that it was a demon that killed him. He wants to find proof that there was a demon that killed him in the first movie. And he gets it with this scene. Right, and then he's like, I, I fucking solved it. There was a demon. I see it. Can I go home now? Like, <laughs> hey, boss. He like he calls up the Vatican or wherever. <laughs> the well, no, he does go back, and they're like, stop investigating this. And he's, but at this point, he's like, I can't stop. I have to save Reagan. Oh, you're right. And yeah. so from that point on, he doesn't wear his priest outfit, and in fact, shows up at the end with this crazy like African shirt. Yep, on. I thought that was a weird choice. Yep. Yeah. So he actually does get told to knock it off later on in the movie but i think he just becomes so enamored with reagan and this is another thing that i've noticed watching this movie a few times it feels like there's supposed to be kind of some sexual tension between oh, yeah. this middle-aged priest and this teenage Teenager. girl. And in fact, I believe that it was originally written so that it was supposed to be a much younger priest. That kind of makes sense. But you definitely get the vibe that he's sort of into her like right away and she's into him. Mm -hmm. Even though they never go there with, oh, they kind of do go there at the end, but there is this weird sexual tension between them, um, which is creepy because he's old and she's young. And a priest. And a priest, yeah. It's all sorts of wrong. But, you know, it was the 70s. Things were yeah. like that back then. Things were loose. <laughs> what was that? It, I don't know if we covered that part yet, but at some point there's the best line in the movie where the someone says to him, like, don't you ever, like, how is it? I wish I could quote it exactly. Like, sometimes you just need a woman, right? And he goes, yes. Do you know the part mm -hmm. I'm talking about? <laughs> The equivalent of being like, don't you ever just want to fuck a woman? And he basically implies I do like that's sort of yeah. that's the, the the what I got from the moment. I can't do the dialogue perfectly. I assumed you would have this written down, Sebastian. Sadly, I don't have that line written down. There's so many crazy things that get said in this movie. I, I can't keep track of it all. I found it, Rodney. It's actually it's Louise Fletcher. She says it's hard to live alone. Don't you ever need a woman, father? And Richard Burton just replies, yes. Yeah, that's it. That was the line. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't even try to be like, no, I have God. Like, nope. Yep. I just need a woman, but I'm stuck being a priest. <laughs> Life sucks. Yeah, I feel like Richard Burton just like said, yeah, like that wasn't actually the line. And then John Borman was like, we're keeping it. That's great. Can we talk about the other things out of the hospital? Like, you know, Linda Blair curing the autistic girl. 
That's right. There's a little autistic girl played by Dana Plato of Different Strokes who tragically died of a drug overdose. So, yeah, drugs are really playing a real role in this. I don't think she was on drugs at the time because she's a little girl. Who knows? But, yeah, Reagan just starts talking to her. And this girl, we've seen, like, somebody's, like, hitting her with a pillow <laughs> at some point. She's not even reacting. <laughs> so she's got, like, some serious – she's seriously on the spectrum here. But then Reagan just starts talking to her and then she starts talking back and is like, you can hear what I'm saying. And then the girl's mother comes in and it's like, oh, my God, she's talking. She hasn't talked for forever or whatever. And Reagan's like, mm hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> Reagan has healed her autism. Mm -hmm. And this plays into the fact that Pazuzu, the demon who we are soon come to know, the locust demon, goes after people who have healing powers, which is why he attacked the woman in the beginning, why he goes after Reagan. Man, I totally, I did not get that at all. Look at you making sense of this film, Sebi. I did not get it all for the first 50 times I watched it either. But then why did he go after her in part one? She's not a healing girl. She's just a little girl. Oh, yeah. If you're going to try to, like, <laughs> make it make sense with Connect the first the dots movie, with I mean, one. forget it. It's not going. It barely makes sense with itself. You can't then have it make sense with the first movie. Well, it wants to be like that, though, because it keeps flashing back to the exorcism from part one, although minus one priest entirely. It is, it is amazing how they just skim past a lot of shit. They're just like, oh, yeah, Ellen Burstyn's, like, on set somewhere. Sorry. And. The other priest, did, did they even mention him? They don't mention Father Karras at all, I don't nope. think. Like, no one says, like, what about that dude that they found dead at the bottom of the stairs? Right, that sacrificed himself, basically. He was like, oh, you come into me, and then goes flying out the window. Yeah, no mention of him. I just wish there was a scene where Richard Burton was like, I'm going to find out what happened to Father Karras. And they're like, I love it, do it. And he's like, and Father Karras. He goes, fuck that guy. No one cares. <laughs> Yeah, we don't hear anything about poor Father Karras from the first movie, but we do have a returning character of Sharon, who was the blink and you miss her sort of nanny or something from the first movie, played by um, Kitty Wynn. Kitty Wynn. And she lives with Reagan in their like swing in new york city skyscraper pad which this fucking apartment is <laughs> so crazy and amazing this is something yeah like and reagan is having like nightmares this happens throughout the movie and she goes wandering out on this roof deck that they have and Everything in this apartment is made out of like a reflective surface, like even like the hanging blinds are all like mirrors. So it, it's like cocaine crazy palace. Right. <laughs> and so she's having these like dreams and sleepwalking and she sleeps, walks out onto this roof deck that has railings on it but that are spaced out so you can just walk <laughs> right past the railing to a, like a 50 story drop down to the street below. And she's like constantly like walking out to the edge of this friggin' roof deck in her nighty and like uh, waking up right at the edge. And apparently Linda Blair really did that. Like that location was real. And she really like went to the edge of the roof. Like those shots where you see her at the edge of the roof, she's really standing at the edge of a friggin' friggin skyscraper roof deck so you're telling me that that someone out there has an actual sky deck or whatever you want to call it where the ledge is only 50 percent there how did that conversation go like the the designer was like okay well you know uh we got your bird feeder decked out in mirrors and we finished the apartment <laughs> but like you don't have quite enough money to get a railing all around your 50 foot balcony or 50 story balcony and they're like, "Eh, just can you just space it out like every other 10 feet?" It is the weirdest balcony I've ever seen. I mean, they probably redid it to suit the plot of the movie. In real life, nobody would be insane enough to make that their roof deck without having a more secure guard around it. I don't think that would ever pass any sort of inspection just by the way. I don't think right. that yeah. would ever <laughs> happen like that is not gonna be fly through the building code that's why again i i stress that the director has never actually been anywhere 
the scariest thing in this movie is this balcony. This is terrifying. Rodney, I agree with you. That is nightmare fuel. Like I am not someone who enjoys heights in that in that way. Like I just there's no way I'm never going to go. I this that would be like a nightmare that I like woke up and I'm staring down at this like off this ledge with no railing. No, no. It happens a few times yeah, in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And like at one point, um, Sharon is talking to um, Dr. Jean Tuscan and she's like, where's Reagan? And she's like, oh, I don't I think she's out on the roof deck. Like so she just goes wandering out there all the time and be like, keep her in fucking side. Like, well, lock the fucking door. <laughs> what are you talking about? And also they have like I don't really understand what's going on out there, but the, they, do they have like doves as pets or something? Yeah. Yeah, there are like doves out there that go flying up. That's why I said there's like this big mirrored birdhouse. It's like it's like it's like home for like 20 doves. Yeah, that was something else too where I just okay. Look, when you have your cocaine skyscraper, you got to have some doves flying around. I mean, it's just the way you do it back in the 70s. Doves. You need your doves, yeah. you need your mirrors, you need your crazy roof decks. Doves are a symbolic of innocence. Oh. Mm. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's it is sort of it is antithesis to the cicadas or the locusts or whatever those things are. They're locusts. They're locusts. I guess they do say locusts like 500 times. Yeah, like a million times. It's all biblical. Rodney dropping some metaphors. That's right. There. Getting deep. Very deep. The deep film. One strange aspect of this movie is this Sharon character. I don't want to blame Kitty Wynn. And she's really just there because Ellen Burstyn refused to come back. So they've got to have some kind of maternal figure. She's even got her hair cut to look kind of like Ellen Burstyn. But the purpose of her character is utterly baffling. At some points, you think she might be possessed or evil or a villain, but they never really go there fully. I cannot understand what the character is supposed to be doing I mean, I understand that she's her guardian or whatever, but in terms of like how she's figuring into the story, I I completely don't know what they're going for to this day. And I've seen this movie multiple times. Same. I I kind of was like thinking that she was a a villain of sorts, but then I'm like, no, I don't. I'm I'm not 100 percent on that. They kind of try to do that a little bit with Reagan, too, I would say throughout where you don't really know if she's starting to get possessed again or something like it feels like they're kind of trying to toy with that well there's this scene where like they go back to georgetown because father lamont wants to see the room where it all happened and sharon agrees to go and show him the room and she's being really weird she's like it's up there yeah. in the room. And it's like, what are we supposed to be taking from yeah. this? I, I took it to mean that she's just so terrified that she refuses to go in the room, you know, like right. the room being from the first one, right? I'll tell you, this This is one of my favorite parts in the movie because they first arrive at the house. And I like a props for like going back to the scene from the first movie, yeah. right? But when they get there, the gate is all like locked up and there's all this like barbed wire that has been added, right? Like this mm-hmm. is definitely a don't go in. In my mind, I remember thinking... I wonder how they're going to get, and before I could even finish the sentence, it just cuts to them in the entryway, and I went, oh, okay. That's how. That's how. (laughs) Connective (laughs) tissue is definitely not important in this movie. There's so much connective tissue that is just not there. There's one that I want to discuss later that's the most baffling to me, but we'll get there. But yeah, it's just such a strange performance from her because i really feel like she doesn't know what she's supposed to be doing and the script doesn't know what she's supposed to be doing no one knows what she's supposed to be doing interestingly these locations are all sets they were not allowed to go back to any of the original sets from the original movie even the street and everything is not it the real street in Georgetown. Wow. Yeah, it was all done on the Warner lot. Wow. They recreated it all there. They tricked me. I I believed it was real. I thought they went back too. I didn't know. Nope, none of it. They couldn't get permission to do any of it back there. So all the locations are fake. I mean, some of them are (laughs) obviously fake, like the stuff in Africa. But yeah, it's all sets. It's all done on sets and back lots. I like to imagine they, they went back to the original house and they were like, Hey, we're doing the sequel. Mind if we shoot here? And they're like, eh, who's directing? They're like, John Borman. They're like, nope. 
you're sort of right. I think they went back and they're like, hey, we're doing the sequel to The Exorcist. And they were like, fuck off. Like, because they did not like the publicity that The Exorcist gave that neighborhood. Oh, no doubt. People were going to those stairs. I went to those stairs back in the 90s when I was touring with my band. We were like, let's go to The Exorcist stairs. And so we went there. I mean, people were just annoyed as shit who lived there that horror fans were coming to see The Exorcist stairs. So I think... You're sort of right. I don't think John Borman was the problem. I think another Exorcist movie was the problem. I'm going to blame John Borman. <laughs> don't you blame John Borman. You need to watch Zardoz and then get back to me. So anyway, the sort of next stage of this movie is that Father Lamont realizes that he's got to go to Africa because during one of these synchronizing sessions that he's now having with Reagan, like why the psychiatrist has decided it's okay for this priest to hop in, put on the head clamps or whatever, and start having crazy uh, sessions with this teenage girl as anyone's guess. But now Reagan and Lamont are doing a lot of synchronizing. <laughs> and during one of these synchronizing visions, they see this vision of, you know, many years in the past, this place in Ethiopia where they're being attacked by locusts. And the locust swarm is actually supposed to be Pazuzu the demon. The whole swarm, that's Pazuzu. And it's attacking this village, but there's this young African boy who is a healer himself, and he can drive away the locusts with this bull roarer, which is a thing that you swing around in the air and it makes this noise. So he's driving away the locusts, but he does eventually get overtaken by them and possessed by Pazuzu. Thankfully, our hero, Father Marin, is there as a much younger man, and he's there to help out Kakumo and perform an exorcism on him. Now, I remember when I first saw this, it was, it was a shock to me to see Max von Sydow as a younger man, because when you see the first movie, the makeup was so convincing, I just assumed that he was that old, Yeah. when really yep. he was much younger in the first movie. He was in his 40s or late 30s, even. This blew my mind, because my whole life, I've wondered, how could Max von Sydow be so old in the 1970s for The Exorcist? Because he just died recently, right? Yeah. So when I watched this last night, I was like, oh, that makes sense. He was just a young man and they put him in makeup. Yeah, it's a confusion a lot of people have had over the years because that makeup job was so convincing. Now when you watch it on like Blu-ray and everything, um, the original Exorcist, you can tell it's makeup. But yeah, back in the day, I remember not knowing he was as young as he was. But yeah, so we see Father Marin trying to help this boy Kakumo and to help him he's got to carry Kakumo in like a stretcher vertically up the side of this crazy ass fucking like mountain crevice to this monastery that is set up high in a mountain which I guess you only get to use if you can make it up this fucking treacherous cliffside that literally kills people when they try to get up it. But it's another sort of bonker scene where we're getting this sort of shot of them climbing up the cliff and it's sort of this side view through this crevice and one of the monks a wind comes and like a demon wind comes and blows the monk off of his handhold and he falls down into this crevice and stuff it's just a crazy bonkers scene look i like the guy i like the guy falling to his death although it looks really stupid like the way he falls it just looks bad yeah. but i do like a good death from by falling and he does like fall into a crevice and like folds in on himself like as though it like breaks his back and i was like okay that's cool <laughs> i have no idea why like no one has built a fucking staircase or a ladder or even like just like a fucking simple elevator that two people crank i was like i don't understand the only way to get up there is to, like basically mission impossible to this shit and just like climb up a sheer cliff face it's so dumb to your point about that fall i think the reason why the fall looks dumb is because he does like three different or four different ways to show you the fall yes like there's one where it's just sort of like a guy falling that just seems normal but then he does this other shot where it's clearly just like a guy standing on something but they're like pulling him down right. and it's not the right speed it's just goofy and there's like four different techniques he uses and three of them don't work but they get up to the monastery and Father Marin successfully 
exercises Pazuzu from Kakumo, but Pazuzu's like, I'll be back one day or something like that. And I think at one point the boy even says like, I'm Pazuzu. Oh, so good. That's, this is, this is good stuff. I like this so much. And I like that we just, cause we don't ever get the demon's name in that other exorcist film. No, made up for this movie. Is it? Yep. And here we get Pazuzu mentioned so many times. And I just, I, I love it. I think you guys are wrong. I think I think they say Pazuzu in the first one. Uh, and we just watched it. I'm pretty sure they do not say Pazuzu ever in the first yeah, one. Yeah, but you have, a, you're, you have an aging mind. <laughs> she only calls, um, in the first one, she's referring to um, Captain Howdy, who is, she's been playing the, the Ouija board with and everything. Well, that's Pazuzu, Jen. I know it is, Rodney, but they don't <laughs> they don't say that. That's not revealed until the sequel. For like 50 years, Jen has been like, they never tell you who Captain Howdy is. is he <laughs> He just kind of disappears from the story. <laughs> I know they're one and the same. I'm just saying we don't get to hear Pazuzu's name repeatedly. I don't think even once until Exorcist 2. Maybe you're right. Or maybe it was added into the 2000 re-release. I, I'm curious because like... Because when I watched this movie last night, Pazuzu was not a new name to me. I, like, knew it when they said it. Maybe it was said in the prequels, and that's why I know it. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things that has sort of been kind of added into the mythology, but it's I'm, I'm pretty positive it was not there to begin with because it's such a ridiculous name, Pazuzu. It's so much fun, though, and I think also that's kind of a, a thing that happens in the first one is that he, the demon won't say who he is. The one time he does say, like, I'm the devil or whatever, but then like... Yeah, he says, I'm the devil. But then, but then later, I remember it's like, name yourself. Tell me what your name is. And it, like the demon won't say who they are. They don't say Captain Howdy or Pazuzu. According to the internet, he's in the original Exorcist novel, which I have not read. That would make sense. I could see that being mentioned in the novel, but not the movie. So let's just basically say I was right and we can move on. <laughs> let's, let's meet halfway on this. <laughs> What happens out of all of this the vision that's been seen is Father Lamont realizes, I got to go find this Kakumo guy because Pazuzu has let it slip that Kakumo is still alive. So he's like, well, the thing to do is to go to find Kakumo. So what we get in this next chunk of the movie, which is about like a half an hour, <laughs> is Father Lamont's search for Kakumo in Africa, which is <laughs> just a weird combination of crazy and tedious because he goes climbing up this mountain and then he gets to the top of the mountain to the monastery and he's got to deal with this crazy ceremony that the priests are having and then after the ceremony he like goes to the head priest and he asks him like hey can we talk about Kakumo and Pazuzu and then the priest is like sure but can you find that guy that fell down the cliff like 30 <laughs> years ago or whatever because like we've been looking for him we can't find him and Father Lamont's like well cool you know I've had this crazy vision staring at the 17 year old with this <laughs> set of strobe lights and I, when I was looking at her I noticed that that guy fell down, but he hit this ledge, and so he's over here. And they're like, oh, really? And so they climb back <laughs> down the mountain, and they go to the crevice, and sure enough, the dude's fucking skeleton has <laughs> been jammed in this crevice. And, like, nobody's thought to look there at all in the past 40 fucking years or whatever, but they're all like, oh, my God, you found this skeleton. And then... They're like, how did you know it was there? And he's like, I told you, I was, I had a vision and I saw Pazuzu. And they're like, holy fucking shit, you saw Pazuzu? And they start throwing rocks at him. <laughs> <laughs> also, you find out here that they do have like an elevator that you can take up. There's like, there's like a, there's like a rope pulley system this one dude sits in. And I was like, you guys are such assholes. You're making everyone climb up. <laughs> You ever have that experience, you're watching a movie and like you're seeing and hearing everything, but you're it's just kind of like mush and it's going past you? Yes. Yeah, this That's is what film. happened during this entire sequence. Yes. I was like, suddenly they're throwing rocks at him and I'm like, wait, why? <laughs> and I was like, I guess it's because he brought up Pazuzu. That's probably a touchy subject around here. But I was just like, what the fuck is happening? This is so bizarre. And is, is this around when like 
he's just now mentally connecting with Reagan or does that happen a little later? Right. Reagan is having a fucking like tap dance review <laughs> at like their school or whatever. This is the tap dancing, right? <laughs> Where they're wearing these like crazy like disco tap dancing <laughs> outfits. And while Father Lamont is getting beamed with fucking rocks, she starts freaking out on stage and like ends up like falling <laughs> off the stage because she's being hit with psychic rocks because of her connection with Father Lamont. Uh, I gotta tell you the the tap the tap dance sequence, <laughs> primo primo stuff. Oh no, I love it! I love it. It, it. This is the kind of crazy that I just love. Like it's so bonkers. Same, no, because it just keeps upping the ante, and it's like, what is what do we need? Oh, tap dancing. We need a tap dancing routine to like da 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 whatever like hello for Hollywood or whatever the fuck they're doing yeah, yeah. New York rag time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever chorus line like glitter like sequin vests and again going back to the trailer it's just this mwah, chef's kiss to have the magic and the ecstasy and then we get quite a bit of the tap dance routine in with the trailer. It's just so, so good. And that trailer with that tap dancing and everything, I think I remember seeing the trailer for the first time. I think it might have been. Did Friday Night Frights show this at some point? Because yes. I remember the, seeing the trailer for it and thinking like, wow, Josh really killed it this time. Because it's just, it's so nutty. It yeah. felt like something that, that Senna family would have done. No, it's the actual trailer. It's the actual trailer. They didn't have to do anything but play it. Yeah, and then after that, like, Father Lamont rents a seaplane from the just recently departed Ned Beatty. And this is, like, the only scene Ned Beatty even has in the movie where he, he gives uh, Father Lamont a ride on his seaplane. And, like, they're flying over the African landscape where all the locusts are swarming or whatever. And there's these planes coming at them shooting pesticide on the locusts. And they have this conversation about trying to kill all the locusts, but they're never going to do it with pesticides or whatever. And then Father Lamont's like, I've traveled this way before. And Ned Beatty's like, oh, really? When? He's like, in my vision, I was riding on the wings of the locusts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think we've also brought up regarding the locust that we do get. Have we talked about getting the locust cam, the locust vision? We have not talked about locust cam. I mean, Sebastian brought it up briefly earlier, but like. Yeah, I brought it briefly. It's one of my earliest memories of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And we really need to take a moment for like several times throughout the film, just getting the the POV oh boy. from the locust. You get a shot of the <laughs> locust from the front. You get a shot of the locust from behind as if you're like on riding the locust. You get one really terrible shot of like a like horizontal <laughs> locust going like across like an African setting or whatever. Yeah, the locust <sighs> shots. But when, like I said, when I was a kid, that was the thing that I remembered because they're just so strange and you've yeah. never seen in any movie and never will again, these sort of shots of a locus center frame flying with like superimposed backgrounds behind it. It's nutty as shit. Yeah. You could almost make a drinking game out of you drink every time you see a locust in this movie and you will fucking die of alcohol poison. Yeah. You'll be really <laughs> drunk. <laughs> I will say it's like it's one of those things that I sometimes have a hard time trying to understand what that visual effect looked like when it came out. Right. I don't know if that actually looked impressive or not for the time based on people laughing and walking out. Probably not. Like I get what they were going for. It's just best way to put this is the locust fills most of the frame. It's like this like it looks like it's the size of a fucking like baseball glove. Right. And it's just like yeah. hovering in the center of the screen. And I was like, what What the fuck is happening? Isn't this The Exorcist 2? Like, where's the demon? Where's the fucking exorcism? That is the demon. The locust is the demon. I get it, but it's dumb. At one point, it shows up in Georgetown. Like, when they go back to Georgetown, it's like in yeah. the, the corner of the room. You see a shot of it in the corner of the room. Father Lamont is continuing on his quest to find Kakumo. He's just like wandering around this like mud city because uh, Ned Beatty has taken him to this mud city because in his vision, he's like, it's like a city that's made of mud or something. So he takes him to this city, which is very much a set, and he's wandering around it. And he's just basically like seeing people walk by and going, Kakumo? Kakumo? Yeah. Like, are you Kakumo? 
But like these guys are like, oh yeah, Kakumo. And then like they take him to like a whorehouse <laughs> and like try to get him a prostitute. This topless woman comes out and he's like, no, no, Kakumo and goes running off. It is impossible to keep this shit like in your mind when you're watching this movie for the first, second yeah. or even third time. I love earlier in the film when he has the vision and he basically says, I'm going to Africa to find Kakumo. And I remember sitting there on my couch being like, how do you, how are you going to do that? Turns out, <laughs> turns out he like goes to the museum with Linda Blair and she's like, hey, you see that painting? That's where Kakumo's exorcism was. And he's like, oh my God, that's so convenient. And that's how he gets to the, the that's like the, you got to climb the rock to the temple place. Yep. And then from that point forward, he basically just like, do you know Kakumo? Do you know? He's like the fish from Finding Nemo, right? Is it Dory? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Turns out if you just ask enough people sooner or later, someone will be like, I do know Kakubo right this way. But the thing that just shatters my whole reality the hardest is he eventually does find Kakumo. <laughs> yeah. And how he finds Kakumo is he finds this building that he recognizes from his vision. He's like, oh, Kakumo, Kakumo's in there. And he goes into the building and in the building is James Earl Jones wearing a locust costume. And to make things even more confusing, in one of his visions, he has seen James Earl Jones in this locust costume, but then James Earl Jones has like growled at him like a jaguar or something, and he's like, he's the jaguar. It's like, he's wearing a locust hat. Well, he he growls, and... And then a jaguar like comes out of his mouth and lunges at him in the dream. I believe it's a leopard for the record. You're right. It's a leopard. Neem, neem, a neem, 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 neem. <laughs> I pushed up my glasses when I said that. Excuse me. I believe it's a leopard. In the novel, it's a jaguar. <laughs> but like, yeah. So we've got this guy who's like a healer who fights locusts and wears a fucking locust costume. Yeah. But he's a leopard. Uh, completely baffling. The, the costume's cool. The costume is awesome. He has scar tissue on his face like whiskers. Because yeah. like when he like when he lowers his head to like look at the floor, the hood of his outfit comes on. And it looks like he has a locust head. If we had a child, I'd want to make them a hoodie that was that locust <laughs> costume. Love it. <laughs> what is your child wearing? Oh, have you seen Exorcist 2? That's what Kakuma <laughs> wears when Father Lamont <laughs> finally finds him in the mud city. <laughs> We don't want our child playing with your child. <laughs> Come along. I now have my Halloween costume this year. <laughs> I can't wait to have to explain a thousand times. They're like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Kakumo, of course. <laughs> Am I, you unfamiliar? <laughs> <laughs> and then you say you're a leopard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a leopard? Oh, it, looks like a, it looks like a locust. No, I'm a leopard. Well, and you're also just a specific version of Kakumo. Because we're going to meet another version. Yes. Okay, yeah. There's never been a fil piece of filmmaking that has baffled me more than this specific piece of filmmaking. So what happens is Father Lamont comes into this building. He sees Kakumo in the locust hat. Then Kakumo's like, you need to prove yourself. He's like, you've lost your faith or whatever. And Father Lamont's like, but I want to help Reagan or whatever. And so look, Kakumo's like, well, you got to prove it. You got to walk onto this bed of nails. And so Father Lamont puts his foot onto the bed of nails. And we see this shot of an obviously like rubber foot going into a nail bed. And it looks really gross. And then he like screams and then he falls over and like cut now he's on like a floor, like a black marble floor or some shit. And he looks up and he's in like a fucking laboratory yeah. <laughs> or something. And Kakumo, as played by James Earl Jones, is now like a scientist who studies locusts. And he's like, oh, let me help you up and let me show you my fucking locust that I'm working on. <laughs> he's got like the white lab coat on. And I got to tell you, I appreciated how trippy this was. I was like, wait, wh what? Like, did I miss something? I don't think this was ever explained, was it? No, that's what I'm saying. It's not explained. There's nothing. It's like all of a sudden it's just, it. It's just, again, it's fever dream, man. It's like all of a sudden here, now I'm in a lab and it's lo we're studying locusts. It's James Earl Jones. He still does have the little whiskers. He does have the, the things, yeah, the tribal markings. But the, the thing that's crazy about it is that 
okay, I would understand if we were to believe that Father Lamont was on some sort of crazy vision quest and he had just kind of arrived here thinking he had seen all this other stuff, but really he had, you know, wandered into a lab in the middle of this African mud city. Oh, okay. But like, Nobody acknowledges, like, any version of the reality. Kakuma isn't like, well, you passed the test, now you're here in a lab, now you've crossed over into the reality where it's a lab. But he's not like, hey, you're just a crazy guy who wandered in off the street. He's just like, hey, let me help you up and show you to my fucking locusts. I think, actually, if I remember correctly, when we were watching this, this was the point when you said, I can't wait to talk to Rodney about this. Uh, well, first of all, I like the I like the part where he, the, the nails go through his foot. I thought it was cool. I thought it looked good. It's gross. But I got to tell you, I was I just was not expecting this sudden shift in events and I don't really know what to say because it made no sense. I I guess like there was something kind of progressive maybe for the time of being like you see not everyone in Africa is like, you know, a shaman or a priest, right? Like there are fucking scientists in Africa. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, th that's cool. But where was he then? Right? Like, right. That's what I'm saying. Where the fuck was he? Like, was he just standing at like the door to the lab staring down and like everyone's just watching a guy like trip and fall and then right <laughs> like you're working at the lab and there's a crazy homeless man out front who's just like wandered in and fallen in the floor right. and then he's like oh okay i'm here i found kakumo are you kakumo he's like i am would you like to see my locusts he's like yeah like I, yeah of course he's like come with me <laughs> and like i feel like james earl jones like at least in his performance he kind of knows what's up like the idea is the little boy kakumo was possessed and he grew up and became a scientist right i think so Right, because Lamont is like, hey, do you remember Father Marin? And James Earl Jones is like, oh, oh, yes, he was a very nice man. And he's like, he helped you with an exorcism. And he's like, well, yes, that's what people said. You know, he's yeah. sort of like, that was the story. Right. He acknowledges it, yes. But he is also kind of being cagey about it. Again, this part was cool because of how weird it was. But there is no explanation. I, it just falls under, like, weird magical shit, right? Like... Is it the demon? It's not the demon fucking with him because this is this is helpful information, right? Like, I don't know. I'm so fucking baffled by this. Baffling is the word. I mean, and I do like it. I like it because it gives me that feeling of like, what is going on? Like, how did they even get away with this? It's just so nonsensical. But yeah, I mean, I do kind of love it. I gotta tell you, I think this movie could have been really great if it just had two changes, right? And one is... If they tried to make it scary, mm -hmm. there is so little scary shit in this two hour runtime. It's basically like a drama. And two, if they just gave the priest a bit of a character arc or a story or fucking something, right? Because like in the first exorcist, it's all about this priest who's like, I don't really believe in supernatural shit. And then like by the end of the movie, you're like, oh, he fucking believes now, right? But like, yeah, if I just cared about this dude and his mission... But he's like, I got to help Reagan. And I'm sitting on my couch being like, help her with what? Like, she seems fine. What the? In fact, yeah. <laughs> she was totally fine, asshole, until you showed up and made her put on the weird glowing machine. You caused all this shit. <laughs> well, and, and uh, what's her name even says that the uh, Sharon character because yeah. he goes back to New York and she's like, if you hadn't shown up, nothing would have happened. Like she expresses exactly what you're expressing later in the movie. So, yeah, I, I guess when I went into this movie, I really thought I was going to watch the story of like Linda Blair gets possessed again and they call in a new priest. And I kind of just wish I got that. Instead, I got this bizarre like fever dream is the only word for it. And I can't, I know there are other movies that are in the same category of weird fever dreams. I feel like Dust Devil, if you've ever seen that, is sort of like this movie, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or The Visitor. Yeah. The Visitor, yes. big time. Yes, it's, it's just like The Visitor. That's a perfect example. If you like that, you're going to love this movie. Oh, yeah. I do like that stuff, which is why I do sort of enjoy this movie. So what we learn here at this Locust Lab is basically that there is a good locust that's like a cricket. And James Earl Jones talks about how the good locust is going to 
hopefully kill all the bad locusts or whatever. And, you know, it's all a metaphor for Reagan. Reagan is the good locust. That's what we learn. And so Father Lamont's like, I got to go save Reagan. Like why this whole trip was just to learn that he needed to save Reagan, which he already basically knew he had to do anyway. So the next section of the movie, which is another 30 minute chunk, is the race to save Reagan. So after Reagan has collapsed on stage at her tap dance review, they took her to recuperate at the crazy lab. She's like lying in a friggin like bed with an IV at this fucking insane psychiatric wing. Why they didn't just take her to a normal fucking hospital? Who knows? But that's where she is. And she gets out of bed and she steals the synchronizer and like puts it in like a shopping bag. And like the lady at the door is like, hey, Reagan, where are you going? And she's like, it's fine. And she just like, and nobody like chases after her. And so she ends up meeting Father Lamont in this like creepy hotel room, which is really sketchy. So they can have their like secret synchronizing session, which, you know, it just feels all wrong uh, in so many ways, especially in this day and age. Yeah. So they have another synchronizing session and they realize that they've got to go to Georgetown or something. Even I, <laughs> I get, fr I forget what they see here. Oh, you know what it is? It's father Marin. And he's like, Father Lamont, you have to act in my behalf now. Like Max von Sydow is talking to Richard Burton from Beyond the Grave. Again. Hey, really? Yes, that's what happens. <laughs> it is so bizarre how I watched this less than 24 hours ago. And I was like stone sober and awake. And I cannot remember that. In fact, I was going to ask you guys, does Max von Sydow say anything in the movie? He does. Okay. He has a bunch of lines, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I guess. It just. It's just what happens, Rodney. It's just what happens when you watch this film. It's so weird. I feel like I'm starting to wonder if maybe the film is like the synchronizer. And there's actually yeah. like, <laughs> like I'm actually being hypnotized by watching it. You definitely are. Yes. And like maybe I, I woke up today really wanting to watch other Warner Brothers films. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give you the comfort of knowing that this is the experience that I've had with the film, your exact experience that you're talking about, and I know Jen has felt the same way. Yep. It's impossible to really pay attention to what's going on in this hour of the movie. It's like these two half an hour segments where just the details are completely impossible to grasp onto because there's no connective tissue between the scenes. You don't know why you're going from scene to scene. That's why you don't remember because you're like, how did I get here? And you're like, you kind of don't care because you're just like, all right, I'm in another crazy place. All right, they've got the synchronizer again. Oh, there's Max von Sydow. He's saying that you have to protect Reagan for me. Okay, the only reason I know is because I watched this twice. And then the second time I watched it, I'm like, really pay attention. Like, what's going <laughs> on? Because I knew nobody else would know. So I'm like, I got to know what's happening. And thank you for your service, Sebastian. <laughs> You're welcome. Somebody had to do it. So what this leads to is what my wife cleverly dubbed as the planes, trains, and automobiles section. <laughs> because... Is this the part where you find out where Pazuzu's family died and he's homeless? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pazuzu is John Candy. <laughs> it ends with Max von Sydow just being like, why don't you just come on over to my place, Pazuzu? <laughs> Oh, my God. And in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, John Candy turns into the devil in that one scene in the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. There you go. There's a connection between They're connected. these movies. <laughs> There's the connective tissue. Right there. <laughs> is that a Warner Brothers film? Because if it is, it might holy be. shit. So, yeah, we've got our two sets of characters racing to Georgetown to the, the original Exorcist location. We've got Father Lamont and Linda Blair uh, Reagan. And they're like going by train. So it's taking them a long time. So in order for them to justify how Louise Fletcher and uh, Sharon don't reach Georgetown before them, all these things happen to stop them. Like they're driving in a car and there's a car accident on the road. And this like guy wanders out of the accident and is like, I need a doctor. <laughs> Are you a doctor? And Louise Fletcher is like, I'm a doctor. I'm and a then doctor. Sharon's like, I guess we're not worrying about Reagan then. <laughs> I know. 
at this point in the film, does the doctor believe in Pazuzu or not? I, I was unclear. Most of the movie, she's like, it's just science. There's no. Well, there's no point to Louise Fletcher's character at all. Like, she really doesn't do anything. But without her, Sebastian, there would be no synchronizer. There'd be no synchronizer. But That's like, right. And that plays a fairly large role. <laughs> You know, her position is that Reagan is suffering from mental problems. Right. That it's not demon possession. She's the skeptic character. She's our scully, so to speak. But it's not really clear. You know, it's just kind of what you gather from a few scenes between her and Father Lamont. But yeah, so they're racing towards Georgetown. And, you know, all these obstacles are getting thrown in their way. They get in a plane and <laughs> there's like... <laughs> There's like an almost a plane crash, like they're in midair and then suddenly the plane starts like going bucking and and, and weaving and they're like, ah, and we get these kind of amazing like model shots of like a plane flying through like a fake sky. I, I kind of love it. It's just so fucking crazy. Are we to believe that Pazuzu is causing all of these like 100 percent? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought, but I just, you know, wanted to make sure I was on the right track. Yeah, Pazuzu don't want them coming there. Mm -mm. Did you notice how, like, dirty the walls of the airplane are? <laughs> yeah. Did this bother anyone? I, was, I literally was sitting there, I couldn't stop looking. I was like, why are the walls, like, it honestly looks like... Like like thirty people were shot in the airplane, and then they <laughs> they tried to clean it up, and now there's just like the, the you can still see like the bloody outlines on the wall. It's probably the same plane they used in every airport movie, yeah. and probably all the actors had been like smoking in between takes. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's nicotine or something. So it's probably all just cigarette nicotine stains. But yeah, it looks dingy and yeah. just gross. It's really gross. Yeah. And then when they have like the mad turbulence and like there's like lightning and everyone's just like getting tossed around and then like they cut back to them like and they're sitting like in the bulkhead like right by the exit door and there's this like man who's sitting with uh, the doctor and Sharon and the doctor is like he's just so like Ugh. and she's like why don't you try loosening your tie? Well, it does help with turbulence. I know. Everyone knows. <laughs> Everyone knows. Loosen your tie. Oh, bless. Yeah, there's like a scene on the train with Reagan and Lamont where like the conductor comes to collect tickets. But like Father Lamont at this point is in complete comatose mode. He's basically like a zombie who's just staring straight ahead and just like Reagan's like following after him like Father Lamont, Father Lamont. And he's just like, Arr. and like at one point the ticket guy comes up to him and then she's like, we need money to pay for tickets. And so she's reaching into Father Lamont's jacket to get his wallet or whatever. And the ticket taker is like, what are you doing? And then Father Lamont turns to the guy and is like, leave her alone. She's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I know I keep saying I was confused, but like, it seemed to me that like Father Lamont has become possessed by Pazuzu or he's like being possessed by Pazuzu. Yes. He basically comes to New York. And then he just basically like turns and starts walking out. And from that point forward, Linda Blair is like, I'm going to follow him all the way from New York to fucking Washington, D.C. And like, I'll make sure he gets on trains and shit. But I was like, why? Why is this happening? Like, why is he a zombie and why is she following him? Is that explained? No, no. no. OK, no. OK, <laughs> no. They've just got to go back to Georgetown for reasons or whatever. <laughs> for reasons. OK. It's not explained. I mean, if it is, it's so poorly explained that I could not even catch it for my fifth viewing or whatever. Wow. Okay. At the tenth viewing, though, Sebastian will have all. That's the when answers. it'll click in, and I'll like call you in the middle of the night, Rodney, like screaming, like I know why they went to Georgetown. Like it'll be like at the end of uh, in the mouth of madness. Like I'll come see you in the hospital, and you'll just be like writing on the wall, and you'll turn and look out through the little bars and be like. I know now why they went to Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> so they get to Georgetown to the set of the original Exorcist and they go up into the room and they find another version of Reagan, like a totally different version of Reagan in the room, a doppelganger, which it has taken me a few viewings to realize this is not just a vision. This is another being. 
because at one point it like falls past Reagan, but it's just like another living form of her. At first it looks like the demon version from her from the original movie, but then it turns into like sexy succubus Reagan. And she's like, come father lament, come join with me. So this is the point where their like attraction to each other is made very clear but like while this is going on at the same time there's like locusts let's swarming against the apartment building and breaking into the apartment so we're getting some like really crazy shots of like richard burton struggling in a locust wind and them screaming and stuff as far as just visual craziness goes it's pretty good i mean it just gets fucking insane i mean this is probably one of the highlights of the movie, right? Cause like we're back in the original house from the exorcist. You're right. Like it feels like all the effects budget, like went to this section of the movie. I have no idea why there's two Reagans. That makes absolutely no sense. I have no idea either Rodney, just so you know, it's not explained. Definitely not. It just is. That's what's there. Another Reagan. Yeah. Like they just, she just doubled. She doubled Pazuzu. Like I look, I guess the answer is Pazuzu made himself corporeal. Yes. And now he's sitting on the bed. It's just like, okay. I got to tell you, the part where she tries to seduce the priest made me like really uncomfortable. That is gross. It's really gross and uncomfortable. But side note, her eyes are really kind of pretty in this (laughs) this green (laughs) demon eyes. I was like, I kind of like her, her demon eyes. It looked a little like the makeup that they use on like Ash's girlfriend in Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2. Yes, yes, yes. It was sort of a similar makeup job. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Her eyes are kind of like, they're almost like yellow green and they're pretty Mm -hmm. and she's trying to be sexy but it's so weird it's weird and uncomfortable it's so weird and there's another voice speaking her voice so you see linda blair like acting sexy but you're hearing this other voice it's it's off-putting in ways that are not intended i think she pulls him into his arms and he's like they're like hugging or whatever. And meanwhile, like the real Reagan is like standing in the doorway being like, no, Father Lamont, no, you need to resist or whatever. (laughs) And then like the apartment starts to literally crack apart. And like you see that they're on some sort of giant set and they're like pulling the set apart. So like now the you know, the bed itself is just being like, held up in this one section of the room and like the walls are cracking open and all the locusts are swarming in. It's not that it looks realistic and scary. It looks fake as shit, but it's kind of awesome just because it's so insane looking. I love it. I agree. I know. I agree. It, It looks mediocre, but it's kind of bonkers fun. And at the same time, the taxi has finally arrived with Sharon and the doctor And like the poor taxi driver, like they're driving towards the apartment and this taxi driver, you know, he's just picked them up at the airport. He's got nothing to do with any of this crazy shit. And like they get swarmed by locusts and the locusts are like splattering against the window and shattering the taxi cab window. The dude like punches a hole in the windshield. (laughs) And but it's too late because he's they're going right for the um, razor wire fence that now surrounds <laughs> the Georgetown apartment. First of all, when they get into the cab at the airport, he says, like, where are you going? And they say the name of the street and he he reacts like, you sure you want to go there? Yep. The implication being that this street is so famous that even he knows about it. Right? Yep. Exactly. But what's really weird is that, like. Not only does the building shake and rip and rip apart, but a cab crashes into the front of it. And for the next like 10 minutes, not one single neighbor comes out to look at this. No one comes out. We totally talked about this last night. We're watching it. We're like, there's no one is coming. Like there's so much going on. The cab has crashed into the building. The building is literally falling apart. Sharon set herself on fire. Like there's a fire burning out front. There's just like 5,000 things going on and it's dead. There's nobody at all. Dr. Jean Tuscan is like covered in razor wire because the cab <laughs> has smashed through the thing and the, the cabbie's poor cabbie's dead. I know. And like Jean Tuscan has got to pull herself out of this razor wire while friggin' Sharon is lighting herself on fire. It's film symmetry because the movie opened with a woman mm-hmm. burning to death. Right. And you close with it, Sebastian. I get that. 
This is why you need me on the show. Cinema symmetry with Rodney. <laughs> Although, to be fair, the mo- the movie keeps going, so it doesn't actually end there. <laughs> This is the uh, the way the storyline essentially ends for these two characters, which is just a real head scratcher because they've come all this way to end up in the front yard. Well, you get a little bit more of the doctor. I mean, yes. like uh, Sharon, she she definitely burns to death, right? I'm not imagining that. We see oh, yeah. her like she burns to death. She doesn't die though. She dies at the very very end. She's still sort of alive, right? Right. In the doctor's arms. But in the meantime, what's been happening is Father Lamont is finally come to his senses and he's no longer being seduced by sexy Reagan. So he jams his hand into sexy Reagan and rips out Pazuzu's heart right out of her body. And then that's the part where then the double goes like tumbling down the stairs that are mm-hmm. like cracked and are like falling apart and goes past the real Reagan. So that's a real corporeal being like falling away. That's just had its heart torn out. But apparently that's not enough to truly dispel Pazuzu who still exists in this locust swarm. And so Reagan does the motion of the bull roaring, which Kakumo did all those years back in Africa. <laughs> and that's what drives away the locusts finally and like there's like a shot of like the capitol building with like the locusts cloud. <laughs> she literally looks like arsenio hall doing the like woo, 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 right i was totally. sitting i'm sitting there watching it and i was like bitch you don't have the fucking thing that you got to swing around you're just swinging your hand like, <laughs> like arsenio. the whole point is that you have the tool like yeah like imagine if like the exterminator showed up at your house and they just like <laughs> mimed like spraying shit and you'd be like, sir, like I don't think that's gonna work. He's like, no, no, no I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> this is the best part of the movie. Watching Linda Blair stand in a locust swarm, just like swinging her <laughs> fist around going, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> I was just like, I kind of wish I had gotten high for this. I really shouldn't have done this sober. Oh, you totally should have gotten high. I should have told you to get high. That's the right way to watch this movie. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know what I was getting into. I just thought it was going to be a mediocre horror movie. I did not expect it to be this. It feels like a really sweaty screenplayer thing. Like, we got to have something that she does that somehow ties it all together. Oh, I know. Kakuma will have this thing that he swings in the air, and then she'll pretend to swing a thing in the air at the end. We got it. We got it. It's just sweaty screenwriting is what it is. But it's kind of awesome. It's it's great. So, yeah, the um, spirit of, of uh, Pazuzu is dispelled by Reagan's bull roaring, and they all sort of gather at the in the ruins of of the Georgetown house. Nobody's come out of their apartments even at this point. (laughs) Nope. There's literally been like post-apocalyptic style destruction. Like the background of the set looks like a post-apocalyptic movie. It's like Washington like in the background and it just seems like we're in a fucking post-apocalyptic movie. But nope, nobody's coming out. They have this exchange where Tuscan tells Lamont that he's got to look after Reagan now. And they're like, Okay, and so they just go wandering off into the wreckage. In a shot that you pointed out, Jen, kind of reminded you of um, the end of The Beyond, the Lucio yes. film. Yes, it, it totally looks like that when they go wandering off into the abyss of the this wreckage, and it's just this couple, and I was like, oh, that's kind of what looks like here, the end. We're getting this like kind of great Anino Morricone score, like, oh, that's how the movie ends and then finally some ambulances show up and, and neighbors. the neighbors are like what was going on <laughs> <laughs> we saw an ambulance well, i heard an ambulance out here and i came out to see what in the world like looking at like look i i, I don't want to get nerdy about this but like the way the house is portrayed there's like steps that go up the side which makes me think that there's like buildings behind it or something but yeah when they like walk off into the woods or something it looks like they're like almost walking <laughs> down a hill like like it doesn't look like what's behind the house should be there you know what i mean no cuz it's just like a fucking rear projection <laughs> <laughs> right right again it kind of feels like the movie ends on this note of like they're going to go off and like fuck you know and like like just sort of like aimlessly wander around and like be a couple like right just, just fucking every bus station they can get to, right? <laughs> <laughs> and i 
I bet you that's in the original script. And Warner Brothers was like, no, John, like we can't, we're going to end it right there. And he's like, you don't understand my art. What about the scene? What about the scene where he fucks Linda Blair's possessed twin? How are we cutting that? And they're like, they can make out a little bit. All right. <laughs> Did you see Zardoz? I'm a genius. <laughs> Well, I think he kind of is a genius. Yeah. I know you do. I will say I do like, again, I rewound it. Certain movies like the credits roll and I go, wait, I didn't know we were at the end. So I like, I rewound and I watched it again and I still don't really know what the priest and the doctor say to each other other than, yeah, like watch over her and then he just like walks off. That's the gist of it. There's more said there, but like it's who gives a shit. (laughs) Then they do the... um. I did like that they start doing like the pulsing white as though you're it's like doing the white on the doctor's face Mm -hmm. as though you're in the synchronizer machine or whatever. Maybe to your point, you are in the synchronizer machine and this whole movie has just been like a bad trip that you've experienced on the synchronizer and now you're coming out of it. Maybe, maybe like on the other end is John Borman, right? And he's like. You're in my mind now. <laughs> Dude, fuck all that Matrix bullshit. Cons- like, are we in the Matrix? I say, are we all being kept in the synchronizer? Ooh. That's going to be like my red pill, blue pill conspiracy bullshit. Dude, we're all being synchronized by the government. <laughs> Some of my other favorite parts in this movie are how, like, people can just, like, take, like, they'll be in the synchronizer and then it's like, take it off and someone else will jump in yeah and like and they'll be like all right I'll, like they're like tapping in their partner like okay i'm gonna go into her mind now and i'm like dude don't bogart the synchronizer and then they'll be like okay so linda blair's like in deep deep trance mode and they're like okay linda or reagan you bring your you bring the priest down to where you're at and she's like okay now you're gonna take a deep breath and go deeper i'm like wait you're already hypnotized but you're now in charge like the rules are very messy. Very messy. Messy? This film? I don't believe it, Rodney. There's no mess in this film. Everything makes Air tight. sense. Airtight. Airtight. <laughs> Connective tissue. I looked it up also. Those are not real devices. You cannot buy them. Aww. What? So, yeah, that was that was a big disappointment. And they're not on Amazon? Me and my wife are going to have a really fun date night. <laughs> It really brings couples closer together when they sink. Yeah. I was a little disappointed that James Earl Jones doesn't show up in the final moments of this film, even in like some kind of like ghost form or something, you know? He was probably off doing the voice of Darth Vader because this came out in 1977, Mm -hmm. the same year as Star Wars. So he may have had another more important job. So this movie made $30 million at the box office when all was said and done on a $15 million budget. So it made a bit of a profit. But Tenpole Trauma is also about movies that are critically reviled. And this movie's critical response was toxic. There is some pretty, like, amazing reactions to this movie this bbc film critic mark commode stated exorcist 2 is demonstrably the worst film ever made it took the greatest film ever made and trashed it in a way that on one level farcically stupid and on another level absolutely unforgivable everybody in this apart from linda blair should be ashamed for all eternity you know the new york times totally destroyed it Gene Siskel gave it zero stars out of four and called it the worst major motion picture I've seen in almost eight years on the job. John Simon wrote, there is a very strong probability that Exorcist 2 is the stupidest major movie ever made. Just goes on and on and on. The the response to this was absolutely toxic. Audiences laughing out of the theater, considered a complete abomination. And, you know, and considering the how big of a hit the original exorcist was 30 million on a 15 million dollar budget was a huge financial disappointment i mean they were lucky to have made that so i'm not going to ask you guys the usual question of why did it fail because we know why it failed it is absurd ridiculous gives you nothing that you want from a sequel of the exorcist and it's just completely mind-boggling what i'm going to ask you this time is exorcist 2 is it so bad it's good because i'm going to say i kind of think it is like this movie is the perfect mystery science theater type of experience it is so bug nuts that it's 
kind of enjoyable to watch. I think it's definitely fun to watch with some friends and some beers or whatever you're going to use to numb your mind. I think that there's enough artistic ambition here to make it interesting so that it's not just boring bad. There is some boring stretches, I will admit, but there's so much crazy crap in this movie that I do find it enjoyable to watch. Fully accepting it is not a good movie. This is a bad movie. And like, if you're a fan of The Exorcist, you're probably going to fucking hate this movie. But I think if you're a fan of so bad it's good movies, this movie is kind of awesome. That's a very tough question. It might be the toughest question I've been asked on Tenfold Trauma. Yes! Because <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. I don't think it, like, there's a that, that very special category of it's so bad it's good. It sort of requires a certain amount of laughability, right? Like you're laughing at the film because it's so bad. My first answer is no. I don't think it's so bad that it's good. It, it's a little too classy, I think. And it's a little too, I don't know, like that had a high budget for the time, you know? But I do think that like the definition also of one of those movies is one where you're like, I want to get my friends together. We're all going to drink and I'm going to show you something, right? Yeah. And I do think this movie is so, it's so beyond anything I thought it was going to be that I, I, I guess, yes, it's just not like Troll 2 level. That's the thing. You know, it's not, it's not incompetently made. It's just like a baffling movie. And I do think that for so bad it's good, you need a certain incompetence to the filmmaking. I think that's what I'm bumping against in your statement. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I agree with you that for a certain type of so bad it's good, incompetence is important. But I think there is a certain level of incompetence, of narrative incompetence that's going on here. Yeah, that's true. Technically, yes, you're right. Technically, everything's pretty much on the professional level. But there are some just baffling choices, even on in terms of technical stuff, that I think it goes there towards incompetence in a way. Yeah, you're you're winning me over. In fact, I, I would say The Visitor is a so bad it's good movie. Yeah. And, and I really Jen, I think you nailed it. This is like The Visitor. So do I really want to watch? There's a, you know, it's weird. There's a little part of me that wants to watch The Exorcist 2 again. Not like immediately, but I could see down the road. Having an Exorcist 2 night. I'm going to call that a win. I just think it's a good time. And I know that it's not a good film. So yes, I guess it does meet the definition of so bad it's good. I agree with what Rodney's saying as far as it's not an incompetent film the, in the in the way that it looks, in the way that it's made. But there are serious gaps <laughs> and just things that don't ever pay off, don't make sense. We get places, we don't know how we got there. As far as enjoying it, the person that enjoyed The Exorcist, what you have to you would have to divorce yourself from The Exorcist when you're watching The Exorcist too. Like you have to just be in a completely different state of mind. Yeah, you can't because it's constantly calling back to their exorcist. Right. So it's like if you haven't seen The Exorcist, you have no idea what the fuck is going right, on. Right, but I'm just saying if you had seen The Exorcist and you're going to watch The Exorcist too, if you're going to enjoy it, you have to divorce yourself in the sense of like, this is not going to be the sequel that I wanted. Right. This is not yes. going to be the sequel that I wanted at all. However, yeah. I can just enjoy the ride because it is a ride and it does have some just weird kind of dull parts of the ride where, you know, I mean, just but they're also at the same time. It's just like, I mean, even with Richard Burton, just like staring off into space for a really long time. I mean, like just the fact that that happened is kind of awesome in its own way that that, you know, this this made it into the the film like this was the fine. And, and I was reading that John Borman was called back to like do multiple edits, like one, like pull it out of the theater and like still was doing some editing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that. I saw something on Wikipedia about how there were two versions of the film. Is that what it was? They like did a, a recut. I think it happened yes. twice where he had to do, do some more cutting of the, the film. Yeah. After it was already out. It's it's a crazy film and I do enjoy it. I still like don't know 100% what's going on. I feel like I learned the most about it today from you Sebastian because of your diligence and perseverance to to really stay with it because I just watched this fucking film last night and I'm still like I'm I'm like with you Rodney in certain parts where it just gets so muddled. I feel like I'm fucked up watching this. 
Like, I don't need that. It's like, I feel like I'm on some sort. I'm in, I am in the synchronizer. But anyway, I, I have watched this many times. I will continue to watch it again because the mood will strike me and I'll be like, hey, let's watch Exorcist 2. Plus, it's got a fucking kick-ass score. Yeah, the music is good. And and like, I still think the cinematography is pretty good. There are a lot of really yeah. cool looking sequences, you know? Yeah, there's great imagery here yeah. for sure. Yeah. One thing we didn't bring up and I'm a little curious about is how come like the Pazuzu statue from part one is not in this movie? Don't have an answer for you there, Rodney. Uh, Well, that's why I come here. I come here for (laughs) answers. Even the statue didn't want to be in this. Even the statue. Right. The statue was like, I'm not going to be in this fucking movie. (laughs) (laughs) Is is Ellen Burstyn going to be in it? No, then I'm not. Fuck off. I don't want any part of this. I'm glad you guys brought this up. I don't think I ever would have watched it if it weren't for you guys. So I'm glad to have seen it because it felt like it felt like a hole, you know, that hole in your horror knowledge to have never seen The Exorcist 2 or 3 for that matter, which I'm going to go on to finish. But now that I've seen it, I get why there was no 3 for like 20 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like nowadays, like after five years, they're like, let's just try again. Like Suicide Squad, they're like, yeah. let's just do it again, yeah. right? Let's yeah, just yeah. keep trying. Exorcist 2 was so bad, they just said, fuck it, we're done. Like, let's just stop. <laughs> Well, Rodney, I I just want to say you're welcome. I'm very happy that we were able to share this with you and uh, make you a fan of the film and of John Borman. Yeah, well, 50% of that's true. (laughs) John, I have an interesting quote from John Borman, by the way. He said... um, Oh, just now? Yeah, just now. He just said right now. I just, he just got it. I got it on Twitter. Uh, No, uh, it said... John Borman confessed that, quote, the sin I committed was not giving the audience what it wanted in terms of horror. There's this wild beast out there, which is the audience. I created this arena and I just didn't throw enough Christians into it. See, there you go. He's cool. He agrees with you, Rodney. Well, he agrees. I don't know if he's cool, but he's fucking cool. He is cool. fucking cool. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to go put on my locust hat and fire up the synchronizer and uh, tear the heart out of a teenage succubus. <laughs> that about does it today for Tent Pole Trauma. If you like what you heard, Check out our social media presence on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just look for Tentpole Trauma. That was easy, wasn't it? If you like us, hit subscribe and leave us a sterling review on iTunes, if you dare. If you really like us, head over to Patreon.com and get involved in one of our fabulous tiers. You'll be glad you did. Want to communicate with Tentpole Trauma? send an email to tentpoletrauma at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And who knows, one day you may even get your email read on one of our shows. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you real soon.